After you hear this first story, you may think twice before placing your next Instacart order. That was how it started. A simple grocery delivery set off a chain of events that culminated in the mysterious disappearance of a young engineer. Strange details were about to surface that would indicate he hadn't intended on vanishing. Something much more sinister had taken place within the desert that summer morning. Daniel was the youngest of the four Robinson children, raised in Columbia, South Carolina. Daniel was born a bit different than the other children, but it seems this unique quality only inspired him to work harder. His right arm came to an end above his wrist. Still, he was determined to achieve his goals and was a real go-getter, according to his father, David Robinson II. He taught himself to play video games and musical instruments, and he even participated in marching band and football. Daniel went on to graduate with honors from the prestigious College of Charleston in 2019, where he joined a fraternity and majored in archaeology. When he was offered a position as a field hydrogeologist with Matrix New World Engineering in Arizona, Daniel accepted the dream job. Eager to begin his new career, he relocated from South Carolina to Phoenix and later moved to nearby Tempe. Perhaps the unusual weather that morning was an indication that the day wasn't fated to be an ordinary one. It was cool and rainy on June 23, 2021. At approximately 9.30, Daniel arrived at his second job site of the day, located in a remote desert area of Buckeye, Arizona. He met up with Ken Elliott, a pump technician at a water resources company. It was the first time they'd been slated to work together, and though Ken didn't personally know Daniel, he became concerned as it was immediately apparent that something was wrong. According to Ken, Daniel was staring off into the distance at nothing in particular and saying things that just weren't making sense. For example, he asked Ken if he wanted to go to Phoenix to rest, and just 15 minutes after he'd arrived, Daniel suddenly got into his 2017 Jeep Renegade and abruptly left the site without so much as a word. Ken informed the project manager of the strange occurrence. Concerned, he then eagerly awaited an update on Daniel as he went about completing his task at the site. When three o'clock rolled around and Ken was informed that no one had been able to make any contact with Daniel, he made his own attempt to locate him. Ken drove to the nearby T in the road. East led back to Phoenix and West led to the vast Sonoran Desert. Ken observed what appeared to be Daniel's tire tracks, so he followed them west into the desert. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to locate the young man, his Jeep, nor any other sign of him. Meanwhile, back in South Carolina, Daniel's father began to worry. Evening had come and he hadn't heard from Daniel since that morning. It was completely out of character for Daniel to fall out of touch with family and friends. David asked Daniel's sister, Davisha, who lived in Phoenix, to visit Daniel's apartment in Tempe, but neither her younger brother nor his Jeep were anywhere to be found. By nightfall, David was overcome with worry and made a call to the Buckeye Police Department to report his son missing. Officers began tracking down and contacting those who had last seen Daniel. They headed to the site and drove around searching for hours, but their efforts proved unsuccessful. As the officers continued to investigate, strange details began to emerge. According to David, Daniel had been acting a bit odd lately. When asked to elaborate, David explained that Daniel had recently informed him that he was in love. However, he seemed to know very little about this woman that he identified only as Caitlin. The investigation led law enforcement to Daniel's close friend, Luke Grieco, who had recently flown to Arizona from New York to stay with Daniel for a weekend visit. Luke recalled that Daniel had said something that struck him as unusual during his short trip. While out at a bar, Daniel stated he was glad Luke was visiting, as he confessed that he'd been feeling depressed lately. But the conversation stopped there, and Luke flew back home on June 20th. His last communication with Daniel had been on the 22nd, the day before Daniel went missing. Roger, Daniel's co-worker and friend, had also noticed a change in Daniel. When Roger expressed his concerns during a conversation with Daniel, he recalled Daniel asking, what if there was a girl you liked but you couldn't have? Investigators soon discovered that Caitlin was most likely the very girl Daniel couldn't have. When they made contact with Caitlin, the story she told was quite alarming, and more questions were raised than answered. Caitlin explained to law enforcement that she and a friend had only recently met Daniel. It was the evening of June 12th, and Daniel, working his part-time side job, had delivered an Instacart grocery order to Caitlin's apartment. Both women were intoxicated, and as a result, they'd thrown caution to the wind and invited the stranger in to join them. Caitlin explained that the incident wasn't a normal occurrence, but considering that Daniel wasn't large in stature and lacked his right hand, 
she had assumed he was harmless. During the course of the night, she and Daniel traded phone numbers, and she sent Daniel an Eckert Toll podcast she thought he'd enjoy. He would later tell his sister that the podcast changed the way he looked at life. Unfortunately, it seemed the revelation would be short-lived. Nevertheless, Daniel and Caitlin exchanged messages in the days that followed, but she explained that the content of the messages from Daniel quickly escalated to a creepy tone. It wasn't long before he was telling Caitlin that he couldn't stop thinking about her and that he loved her. The messages struck Caitlin as very unsettling. Most frightening to Caitlin was the fact that Daniel would come to her apartment unannounced after explicitly being told not to. It made her very fearful, and she clearly expressed the sentiment to Daniel through text messages. Showing up uninvited after being told not to is a sign of harassment. If someone does that to you, it indicates that they don't respect your boundaries or personal space. You may need to consider involving police for your own safety. On June 21st, Caitlin sent one last message to Daniel in response to his question, do you hate me? She replied with, I don't hate you, but please leave me alone. On the following day, just one day prior to when Daniel was last seen, he sent Caitlin a cryptic final text message. The world can get better, but I'll have to take all the time I can or we can, whatever to name it. I'll either see you again or never see you again. Time would reveal that the latter of the two was most likely the correct prediction. After Caitlin provided the disturbing details of her communication with Daniel to law enforcement, an officer informed her of the injunction against harassment process and recommended Caitlin make an official complaint with the Phoenix Police Department to document all of the unnerving details. All the while, Daniel's family was growing frustrated. They felt the investigation didn't take off as quickly as it should have and feared valuable time had been lost. On July 25th, a request for a helicopter search was finally approved. But to the disappointment of all involved, the search yielded no trace of Daniel nor his vehicle. As the days slowly passed and Daniel remained missing, his father could no longer wait from afar. He threw some belongings into his vehicle and headed to Arizona. With little resources and funds, he coordinated his own search efforts and investigation into his son's disappearance. Over time, the Buckeye Police Department picked up the pace and launched an extensive search operation as well. Helicopters, cadaver dogs, and ground forces scoured approximately 70 square miles of desert area, yet not so much as a shred of evidence was found. David soon hired a PI, the former police officer and vehicular crimes investigator by the name of Jeff McGrath, led an independent investigation. Soon after, on July 19th, the development finally came. Daniel's Jeep was discovered, but nothing about the findings seemed to make any sense. A rancher had made the discovery despite previously unsuccessful helicopter, drone, and ground searches. Given that the area was only a few miles from the work site, David was certain the specific spot had been thoroughly combed at a previous time by law enforcement and his force. That was just the tip of the iceberg. The Jeep was located at the bottom of a 20-foot ravine. It had been flipped onto its side, the driver's seat was buckled, the airbags were deployed, and the vehicle showed obvious signs of significant damage. Daniel's belongings, including his wallet, phone, and credit cards were all found inside, and clothing items from the morning he'd last been seen were sprawled on the ground within a few feet of the Jeep. There they were. T-shirt, jeans that had been turned inside out, orange work vest, mismatched black socks, and work boots. Quite mysteriously, one of his work boots was stuck under the Jeep. However, despite the damage, no blood nor any sign of Daniel's remains were found. Jeff later located another black sock three miles away from the scene within the desert area, a match to one of the socks found at the site. It was perplexing, and it further reinforced the idea that there was much more to the story than met the eye. Then a shocking finding occurred at the end of July. Near the location the Jeep had been found, a human skull was discovered. Upon further investigation, it was determined that the skull didn't belong to Daniel, to the short-lived relief of family and friends. The theory adopted by law enforcement was that Daniel crashed his vehicle, undressed for an unknown reason, and abandoned the scene. And according to David, even more far-fetched, they proposed Daniel then joined a monastery to become a monk. As law enforcement saw it, a criminal investigation was unnecessary, given the extensive damage to the vehicle they believed Daniel had caused. Contrary to the opinion of law enforcement, the significant damage to the vehicle was the precise reason David and his team suspected criminal activity was undoubtedly what led to Daniel's disappearance. The rancher agreed with Jeff and David, 
He'd observed that the vehicle's exterior was unusually clean given its desert location, and his cattle had never come across it during the preceding four weeks since Daniel had last been seen. He was adamant that the inquisitive animals would have found it had the Jeep truly been there for an extended period of time. He believed that the vehicle had been deliberately wrecked, then dumped into the ravine, a terrible thought that would soon gain credibility. The theory was further reinforced after the disturbing black box GPS results were uncovered by Jeff. A crash had taken place approximately four hours after Daniel was last seen, causing the airbags to deploy. The vehicle was estimated to have been moving at approximately 30 miles per hour. According to Jeff, there was no possible way a crash at that speed could have taken place in that particular area of the desert, considering its extremely rough terrain. The vehicle was then driven, get this, another 11 miles. In addition to that, the ignition was turned an additional 46 times after the crash. Jeff also noted that the Jeep appeared to have been hit with a blunt object above the windshield area, and another disheartening finding provided by the black box. There had been multiple crashes. Despite the discovery of the Jeep, the million dollar question remained. What had become of Daniel? David and Jeff proposed that Daniel may have been upset about the situation with Caitlin, and as a result, binged on video games all night and through the early morning hours. By the time he arrived at the second site that fateful June 23rd morning, he was overcome by sleep deprivation and drove a few miles into the desert to take a nap. That's when they believe everything took a drastic turn south. Daniel must have been in the worst place at the worst possible time and crossed paths with some form of evil. They can only speculate as to what transpired next. Currently, somewhere between two and four sets of human remains have turned up during searches. Could a serial killer be using the secluded area as a dumping grounds for their victims? Jeff isn't ruling out the idea that the deaths could, in fact, be related. As the months scroll by, David continues his search efforts, despite the fact that he's exhausted his savings and retirement funds, and currently relies on donations from a GoFundMe site. Sadly, the goal of the mission has changed. You can imagine after seven months, it's no longer a rescue mission, he explained in January. It's a recovery mission out in the desert. David still doesn't buy into the idea that Daniel disappeared on his own accord. He thinks someone out there knows something, and he won't stop searching until he finds his son. Red Flags Daniel reported to his friend Luke that he was feeling depressed. It's possible that his depression was a contributing factor in his disappearance. Daniel's odd behavior at work on the day he disappeared including staring off into the distance at nothing in particular and saying things that just weren't making sense is another red flag. A possible explanation for this strange behavior is that a slowing down of thought and diminished ability to think or concentrate can be symptoms of depression. These strange behaviors could also be related to another mental health disorder. Again, it's important to remember that Daniel was never formally diagnosed with depression or any other mental health disorder to our knowledge. Claiming to be in love with Caitlin when in actuality he knew very little about her is a red flag. In addition, the stalking behavior he showed by going to her home unannounced on multiple occasions, even after he was asked to stop, is very concerning behavior. It suggests that he may have been having difficulty regulating his emotions. It's possible that Daniel's feelings of dismissal by Caitlin, along with his previously reported depressive thoughts, led to him choosing to disappear of his own accord. Suffering from a major disappointment, such as a romantic rejection, can be a trigger for someone to take their own life who's already depressed. If you're concerned that a loved one is showing warning signs of wanting to take their own life, encourage them to seek professional help from a mental health counselor or other trained professional. But remember, you're not responsible for the choices someone else makes. You can support your loved one and encourage them to get help, but ultimately, it's up to that person to get the help that they need. If you are in need of immediate help, please call 911. Otherwise, please contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK-8255 or text the Crisis Text Line. Text HELLO to 741-741. Both of these helplines are free, available 24-7, and are confidential. Now, where's your emergency? Um, I can't find my daughter. Okay, when was the last time you seen her? 
we were murder at the park down. People said that somebody, probably somebody took her. Okay. How old is she? She's five years old. Okay. Hi, ma'am. Stay in line. I'm going to turn you over to the police, okay? The terrifying 911 call you just heard was placed shortly after the young mother, Noema Alaves Perez, had watched as her two children excitedly jumped out of their car, ice cream in hands. They ran for the playground, and she soon followed after them, making her way to the swings that hadn't been visible from her vehicle. In the blink of an eye, every parent's worst nightmare had become her reality. Her little girl had seemingly vanished into thin air. The family had settled in Bridgeton, New Jersey, a small city surrounded by vast rural farming land located roughly 45 miles south of Philadelphia. Noema Alaves Perez, 19 years old at the time, was the mother of five-year-old Dulce and three-year-old Manuel. Noema's parents and little sister, eight-year-old Camila, lived near Noema, and custody of little Dulce was shared with her grandmother, whom with the children lived. According to Noema, her parents loved the children as if they were their own. September 16th, 2019 had initially presented itself as an ordinary late summer day. Around 4 p.m., footage from a local store showed Noema, her sister Camila, and her two young children picking out frozen desserts. After grabbing their ice cream, they headed to the popular Bridgeton City Park. Located near the high school, the park consists of around 1,100 acres of land, including walking trails, picnic areas, and playing fields. Dulce and Manuel made a beeline for the playground while Noema and Camila stayed behind to watch the children from the car. Noema decided to scratch a lottery ticket as she assisted Camila with her homework. The seemingly normal afternoon would soon take a turn for the very worst, as they would come to find that someone else had been watching as the children played. From her car, most of the playground could be seen, but based on Noema's account, the swings were hidden by a small hill. Not long after their arrival, Noema and Camila noticed the children were no longer visible. They exited the vehicle and approached the area, approximately 30 yards from where they had parked. But when they arrived at the swings, Manuel was standing there in tears. His ice cream was on the ground and he was alone. His older sister Dulce was nowhere to be found. When asked where Dulce had gone, Manuel pointed to nearby buildings. Noema assumed Dulce was just hiding. When they made their way to the nearby buildings, however, Dulce wasn't there. That's when the terrifying reality of the situation started to set in. Dulce was gone and the harrowing search for Noema's daughter began. Noema frantically questioned those close by. Had they seen her little girl? Horrifyingly, a few bystanders stated that Dulce had been chased by two men near the buildings that Manuel had pointed out. Noema promptly called her brother, who lived a short distance from the park, and enlisted his help. She asked him to bring his dog and try to locate the little girl. She had no way of knowing who they might be dealing with. They briefly continued the frenzied search with no success. Noema made her frantic 911 call at approximately 4.50, roughly 40 minutes after they had arrived at the park. Chaos ensued as Noema did her best to relay information and answer questions posed by the dispatcher, her voice shaking. Okay, and what park are you at? Here in Bristol Park. Um, the one with the basketball court where high school is. And uh, what was she seeing last wearing? She was wearing, um... I just remember her pants. She was wearing like a flower, flowery pants and some heels. Hi, did you see which direction your child went? No, um, we were in the car. She she came down with my son. They were running to the park, and then me and my sister we came down. But when we, when we got here at the park, she wasn't here because uh, somebody um threw his ice cream in the floor, and my daughter just ran away. Within minutes, police arrived at the scene, and an extensive search of the park began immediately. Dozens of officers and bloodhounds were employed. The search extended to surrounding areas, including the nearby neighborhood, the lake, and the wooded area. However, not so much as a shred of evidence was collected. An Amber Alert was quickly issued. The key suspect was described as a light-skinned, possibly Hispanic man, around 5'6 to 5'8. It was believed that he had led Dulce into a red van. A flood of tips came in. However, authorities were unable to locate a red van that had any connection to the disappearance. Two weeks had passed since Dulce's disappearance, and Noema, who had been criticized for her stoic demeanor, spoke out for the first time, imploring the community for their continued help. In mid-December, approximately three months since Dulce was last seen, law enforcement, along with city officials, took flyers door-to-door -door 
and reminded the public that Dulce had yet to be found. They pleaded for anyone with information to come forward. When early January rolled around, family and friends had become discouraged as interest in Dulce's case had waned, and it seemed the community had mostly given up trying to find the missing little girl. Jackie Rodriguez, who had become a spokesperson for the family, led a march from Bridgeton City Park to the City Hall to appeal to the mayor for more assistance. By that time, the reward money had climbed to $75,000, and everyone hoped the funds would be enticing enough to gather the missing pieces of the puzzle. Unfortunately, the public had nothing useful to contribute to the investigation. Then, March brought along with it a series of eerie occurrences. Cryptic letters were sent to a variety of locations by an unknown source. Recipients were in both New Jersey and Ohio. Jackie received one such letter early that month. It was postmarked Cleveland, Ohio, and in the envelope were slips of paper, with phrases including Alaska, Mexico, 1776, border, and civil war. Barely legible, they appeared to have been written by a child. In her spokesperson role, Jackie had become accustomed to being contacted in reference to the case, but the fact that the letter came to her personal residence brought along with it a new sense of trepidation, and she began to fear for the safety of her own family. The letter to Jackie didn't specifically mention Dulce, but a string of others received two states west in Ohio were alarming. One was sent to the attention of the manager of Hollywood Gaming at the Mahoning Valley Racecourse, a casino and horse racing facility located in Austintown, Ohio. The letter read as follows, 76 truck stop, dead end street, entrance woods, please look. Some believe the letter could be the key to finding a little Dulce. A multi-day extensive search of the 30 to 40 acre wooded area quickly ensued. Complete with drones and cadaver dogs, the vast area was scoured for clues. However, no evidence was found despite the thorough search. One of the other peculiar letters was sent to the Austintown Library, also in Ohio, two pages in length. It included details about the investigation into Dulce's disappearance. And yet another letter was received by an ice cream shop in Wethersfield Township, Ohio, located in a neighboring county to that of Austintown. The letters were similar and believed to have originated from the same source, but they served only as another setback because they didn't lead to Dulce. The months continued to pass and soon a full year had gone by without Dulce's return. Noema expressed her gratefulness toward the many members to the community for their continued support. To the skeptics, she reiterated that she and her family had no involvement in the disappearance. She also voiced her regrets about letting the children leave her sight that day. At the same time, FBI Special Agent Daniel Garibrandt revisited the case. He explained that it was possible no one besides the perpetrator had noticed Dulce at the park before she was taken. Because the school day had ended approximately an hour earlier, the area was busy and chaotic. The abductor was likely lurking, blending in, and waiting for an opportunity to strike. The special agent added that there were likely witnesses who observed the abductor and haven't yet come forward, either because they don't realize how important their information is or simply out of fear. At the time of Dulce's seventh birthday on April 25th of 2021 and 19 months after she vanished, the Bridgeton police chief assured the public that various law enforcement agencies were continuing to collaborate and working on developments, though he did not elaborate. Dulce's father, Edgar Perez, who had been deported to Mexico in late 2018, had been silent until a YouTube video surfaced, apparently a tribute to Dulce on her birthday. A compilation of music, footage of a younger Dulce and her father's narration. As the months continue to crawl by, occasional tips are received, both through the FBI and the county. Of course, the frequency decreases as time passes, but investigators believe Dulce is still alive and they will continue to assume she is so long as there is no reason to believe otherwise. The case seems to have struck a chord with many, tugging at their heartstrings and making it impossible to forget about that little girl. Online sleuths offer a variety of speculations as to what may have happened to Dulce. Some surmise that though the abduction was an unthinkable act, it was simply a crime of opportunity. Perhaps Dulce was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the perpetrator struck when it was clear that no other adults had their eyes on the child. Others speculate that her father might have arranged for Dulce to be transported back to Mexico to be with him. However, the FBI interviewed Dulce's father shortly after her disappearance and described him as cooperative. There had been no known custody dispute over Dulce, 
and the FBI felt investigators would have located evidence had Dulce been taken out of the country. Of course, there are the skeptics, those who believe Noema knows more than she lets on, though there's no way to gauge how behavior should appear after a traumatic event has occurred. Many have been very critical of what they've interpreted as Noema's indifference. They've gone so far as to speculate that she has knowledge regarding Dulce's whereabouts. However, there's no evidence that this is the case, and law enforcement has never named Noema as a suspect. People can respond to trauma in different ways. Some people may express their distress outwardly, perhaps by crying, sobbing, or other high emotional responses. Other people may internalize their pain, outwardly showing almost nothing while inwardly feeling great turmoil. Noema may have responded this way. The tragic abduction has changed the dynamics of the community, its innocence lost in the ordeal. Family, friends, law enforcement, and those following the case all hold out hope that one day the little girl will be found and reunited with her family. Red Flags and How to Prevent Abductions Unfortunately, there don't appear to be many known red flags in this case. If it was a random abduction, the abductor was likely waiting at the park for the right opportunity to arise, such as an unsupervised child. This case is every parent's worst nightmare. It's easy to blame the parent in cases like this and to say that they should have been watching their children more closely. However, a park should be a safe place for kids, and Dulce was old enough at five years old for her mother to reasonably believe she could be out of sight for a few minutes in a public area for kids. Random child abductions are extremely rare, but they can happen. It's much more likely that a child will be harmed by someone they know. However, always contact police if you're concerned or feel you or a child is unsafe somewhere. If you see something more alarming, such as two men chasing a little girl as bystanders in this case reported seeing, there are some things you can do to help even if you're unable to intervene yourself. Contact police, make a note of the physical descriptions of the alleged perpetrators and alleged victim, and pay attention to the direction they go and the vehicle they leave in, color, make or model, and license plate. Before Tracy Bradley headed to work early Friday morning on July 6th of 2001, she explicitly told her two little girls, Tianda and Diamond, not to let anyone into the apartment while she was away. When she returned back home around 11 a.m., however, the apartment was eerily silent, and the girls were nowhere to be found. All that had been left behind was a suspicious note, seemingly written by 10-year-old Tianda, stating that the two girls had gone to the playground. Unfortunately, everyone would soon find that this could not have been further from the truth. The bunch of sisters included Tianda, 3-year-old Diamond, 12-year-old Rita, and 9-year-old Victoria. Rita and Victoria had been dropped off the previous night at their grandmother's nearby apartment within the Robert Taylor Homes, a large area of public housing on Chicago's impoverished south side. The girls shared time between their mother's apartment at Lake Grove Village Apartments and grandmother's place, as well as with other relatives who lived nearby. Tracy worked hard to care for her cherished girls, and the relatives worked together to help care for each other's children. That Friday morning started out like any other summer morning, Tracy arose early to head to work at the summer lunch program where she was employed. At 6 a.m., she woke Tianda to say, I'm locking the door and I'll call you. Don't go out that door. Tracy's boyfriend, who was also at the apartment that morning, was said to have arrived a few hours earlier, then left with Tracy and drove her to work. Family members assert that Tianda called her mother's cell phone and left a message a couple hours later, around 8.17 that morning, asking if it was all right to let a man into the apartment. The man's name was the same as Tracy's boyfriend, as well as a neighbor. However, it was said that the neighbor went by a nickname, not the name Tionda mentioned in the voicemail. The boyfriend confirmed he'd taken Tracy to work that morning, but he denied returning to the apartment a couple hours later. While at work, Tracy stated that she called home to check on the girls, but there was no answer. She waited an hour, then placed repeated calls to her home. Still, the calls went unanswered. According to family members, other elementary school children had seen the girls playing on the playground at Doolittle Elementary School that morning, located just a few blocks from their apartment. As the summer school session began at 9, they assumed the girls headed back home at that time. Tracy returned home around 11.30, but the apartment was dead silent. Tianda and Diamond were gone. All that was left behind was a suspiciously error-free note that had been placed on the back of the sofa. 
It read that the girls had gone to a nearby store in the elementary school playground. It was later confirmed by the FBI to have been written by Tianda. Initially, Tracy didn't think much of the girl's absence, despite the fact that Tianda was not one to leave notes. Still, she assumed the little girls were just playing in the area surrounding the apartment complex. She went about her business that afternoon, purchasing food at a local store. Her receipt was stamped to show a time of 1221. When she returned home, there was still no sign of the girls. She contacted family, friends, and the elementary school. However, no one could provide information regarding the girls' whereabouts. To add further confusion to the situation, neighbors reported seeing the children playing just outside the complex around 3 o'clock that same afternoon. However, eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable, and despite people usually having good intentions, they're often mistaken about what they claim to have seen. When the darkness of night set in and there was still no sign of the girls, the local police were contacted. And so began the search that may very well have been Chicago's largest missing persons investigation yet. Tracy was described by police as cooperative at the onset of the investigation. She answered questions posed by law enforcement for roughly 22 hours over the first several days that followed the disappearances. She and her boyfriend were both administered lie detector tests, and according to law enforcement, both passed. However, some close to the family alleged that the boyfriend's test was actually inconclusive. The family asserted that they provided the phone with a voicemail from Tionda to police shortly after the disappearance and that law enforcement inadvertently deleted the message. However, law enforcement couldn't confirm the scenario, strangely enough. Initially, the disappearances were categorized simply as missing, which implied that the children had not been abducted, but had simply chosen to leave the apartment that day. However, due to the overwhelming outrage expressed by family and the community, the case was quickly reclassified as missing or endangered. Tracy was adamant that the children knew not to leave, nor would they have had a desire to run away. Why Tracy didn't attempt to find the girls right away remains a mystery, especially because the first 48 hours are the most crucial in missing person cases, and statistically, the chance goes down significantly of finding someone alive after that point. Immediately, a wide range of resources were utilized as searches promptly commenced, including the Chicago Police, the FBI, the Police Marine Unit, and the Fire Department. In addition, helicopters and tactical teams were employed. Door-to-door -door visits were conducted, canines assisted, and flyers were distributed. Before long, Tracy grew weary of the repeated questioning and began to feel as though she was being looked at as a potential suspect. Soon, she'd retained an attorney, resulting in a strain on the previously open communication between her and the police. While the police superintendent acknowledged the exhaustive questioning was frustrating to the family, he also conveyed how it was imperative that nothing be overlooked. After all, Two little girls had seemingly vanished into thin air. In addition to the girl's mother, law enforcement also focused on Tracy's boyfriend from the get-go. Several witnesses approached the police and had an intriguing story to share. Each alleged they had seen the man set a fire in a 55-gallon drum in his garage the very same day the girls had vanished. According to the witnesses, he then placed the drum into the trunk of his car and departed his residence. When questioned by law enforcement, however, he denied burning anything in a drum. In fact, he stated he never even had a drum in his possession. But that wasn't the only piece of troubling information concerning the boyfriend. The finding came as a shock. Hair identified as Tionda's was found in the trunk of his vehicle. His explanation to investigators was that he would sometimes sneak the girls into drive-in movies by hiding them in his trunk. The plausibility of the claim came into question, however, his drive-ins were confined to the suburban areas. Along with the allegations concerning the drum and the discovery of Tionda's hair, perhaps the most disconcerting discovery was a Home Depot receipt police found at the boyfriend's property. The recent purchase included contractor trash bags, rubber gloves, and bleach. Suspicious, to say the least. And not surprisingly, the boyfriend then swiftly retained an attorney of his own. The combination of the findings involving Tracy's boyfriend had more than convinced some family members that he was responsible for the disappearances, and they urged prosecutors to bring charges against him. However, due to the fact that the evidence was circumstantial in nature, no charges resulted, and many were disappointed. Within the very early days of the investigation, nearly 500 police officers assisted in efforts to locate the little girls. Law enforcement left no stone unturned as tips flowed in no matter how vague or seemingly outlandish. 
One such anonymous tip that came in was provided by a man who described himself as a minister. He told of a revelation he'd had while praying for the girls. In his vision, he said he'd seen two bags being thrown into the water, the contents believed to have been the little girls. Divers were urgently dispatched to the Washington Park Lagoon and a thorough search was conducted, but the vision proved to be no more than a figment of the minister's imagination. Another tip pointed to two separate mounds of what looked to be freshly disturbed dirt located about two blocks apart within the Dan Ryan Woods, which were approximately 10 miles from Tracy's apartment. Sniffing dogs were brought in to aid in the search. The mounds proved to be nothing more than a combination of landscaping materials and compost upon close examination. Prayer vigils were held every night for the first 40 nights after the girls vanished, but over time, hope began to dwindle and nightly vigils were discontinued. Within the months that followed, comprehensive searches continued. Over 5,000 abandoned buildings within the city were searched, lakes and rivers were combed, more than 40 tons of garbage were examined, and many interviews were conducted by law enforcement. Among those interviewed were approximately 100 sex offenders. Despite all of the efforts, law enforcement wasn't any closer to solving the case. The passage of four years hadn't softened Tracy's grief in the slightest. More years rolled by and no progress was made in the case. Leads became fewer, none of which amounted to anything of value. Then an unexpected development occurred around 11 years following the disappearance. A peculiar email appeared in the inbox of Sheila Bradley Smith, the girl's great aunt who'd been relentlessly advocating for the family all those years. The sender, a woman located in Gary, Indiana, told of an alleged event that had been weighing heavily on her heart for quite some time since the day the girls disappeared, to be exact. That day, the woman's boyfriend paid a visit to her home, arriving in a panicked state. He was visibly shaken, she explained. What came next was quite unnerving. He told her that he did something messed up and further added that she saw it and he had to kill her. Perhaps this was the missing piece to the puzzle. Perhaps the family would soon receive the answers for which they'd waited so many years. As promising as the information appeared to be, Shelia stated that the woman was not cooperative with police, and police wouldn't divulge any details about the situation. Shelia quickly grew frustrated with yet another dead end. More than two decades have come and gone, the girls have yet to return, and the many leads have gone nowhere. The tragedy has taken its toll on the family. They believe that the assailant was someone Tionda and Diamond knew and trusted, as the girls had learned to be suspicious of strangers. Shelia feels that the individual was right alongside Tionda as she wrote the message, looking over her shoulder and coaching her, which would explain the perfect punctuation and spelling not consistent with the 10-year-old skill level. As with many cold cases, online sleuths have taken interest in this particular one. Many speculate that the boyfriend may very well be responsible for the disappearances. It's said that he's Diamond's father and that there was an ongoing child support dispute. Perhaps he felt the child support would not be an issue if Diamond disappeared. If the woman from Gary who emailed Sheila was also dating Tracy's boyfriend, the idea could make sense. Maybe Tionda had witnessed something she shouldn't have and therefore also had to disappear. However, the boyfriend still maintains that he had no involvement. There have yet to be any arrests or charges in this case. The family remembers the children just as they were so many years ago. Tionda, the quick-witted child who loved to dance, and Diamond, the reserved little one with the sweet smile, eyes always on her big sister. Shelia reflected on the tragic case. People talk, people get old, people go to jail. I'm just praying someone will come forward with the information. The world will know Tionda and Diamond by the time I'm done.